So far we've talked a lot about electrostatics and electricity, and now we're going to add something new. Magnetism is actually closely related to electricity, and we're going to look at that connection over the next few chapters. The two basic sources of magnetism are electric currents that create a magnetic field, and natural magnets, also called ferromagnets, since iron is the most famous example. The magnetic field in some ways is like the electric field. We're going to use a B to represent it, because M is used for the internal field of the magnet, which we won't get into. Field lines that are drawn around a ferromagnet, like this cheap bar magnet here, look like the picture here. So we've got these circles where the lines come out of north, the North Pole and go into the South Pole. Things that you notice about this, just like with E-fields, the lines are more densely packed where the field is stronger. The direction of the field is tangent to the field line, so for example right here it would be off this way. This is also like the E-field line. Field lines can't cross because then the field would have two different values at that point of intersection. So far all these things are just like the E-field. One big difference is the magnetic field lines are in loops. If this were an electric dipole where we have a plus charge here and a minus charge here, the field lines would originate on the positive and uh, end on the negative. Here they don't originate on the north and they don't disappear into the south. They just are loops that are directed towards or away from those. So that's kind of a big deal. The reason for that we'll find out later is there's no such thing as a single isolated north pole or south pole. Now for ferromagnets, the kind of magnet you might have played with when you were a kid, uh, the source of the magnetism is connected with the energy levels of the material's electrons. You might have seen this in chemistry where they looked at things like N, L, M, and ML, different quantum numbers, different values for the electrons in different shells. And they also talked about whether they were spin up or spin down. For a very small number of elements, mainly iron, nickel, and cobalt, uh, the way these electrons combine is to leave a net magnetic field left over. They don't cancel each other out. In most materials, they do cancel each other out. So the individual atoms are acting like tiny little bar magnets with a north and a south. And in ferromagnetic materials, these atoms tend to line up like their neighbors. So these little tiny areas, and these are usually going to be significantly smaller than a millimeter. So there's still a lot of atoms there, but these are not really something you'd be able to see easily with the naked eye. Uh, they'd typically be thickness of a hair, something like that. Uh, you can see this illustration here. We've got a whole bunch of different domains. That's what the little arrows represent. Everything in this domain is pointing this way. So these things point like their neighbors, but they don't point like their distant neighbors necessarily. If we turn on a magnetic field, what we start to find is the domains that were pointing in the right direction will expand. The domains that are pointing in the wrong direction will tend to shrink. And if they're near the right direction, they'll tend to turn around. So the, the overall effect is, depending on how strong the external magnetic field is, we start to line up these domains. The absolute limit would be if the entire magnet is one domain, all the atoms are lined up and pointing in the same direction. This is called saturated. Once we get to this point, it doesn't matter how much we turn up the external field. The field in the magnet is not going to get any more ordered. If we have an unmagnetized piece of iron, so just a random crowbar or a nail, the domains will point in all directions, add up to essentially zero. Uh, if we put it in the magnetic field, we can magnetize it because once it's somewhat lined up, we turn off the external magnetic field and a ferromagnet will maintain that alignment, so it will continue to be a magnet. Now, if we do something like drop it on a hard floor or heat it up, we can randomize these things and screw that magnetism up. So that's why you don't drop a magnet or don't heat it up because you tend to destroy the magnetization. We can detect the field that the magnet produces by looking at what it does to a moving charge. Electric fields act on all charges, but magnetic fields only act on moving charges. And the charges have to be moving at least a little bit perpendicular to the field. So the way we would write this is 
the force on that charged particle is QV cross B. We know that the units of charge, velocity, and force are coulombs, meters per second, and newtons. So we could solve for the units of magnetic field and get newton seconds over coulomb meters, although there's a simpler unit, the Tesla, which is much easier to, to deal with. Uh, it's again a capital T because it's somebody's name. Uh, a magnetic field of one Tesla, for example, is really strong. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field is about 50 millionths of a Tesla. There's a common uh, unit of magnetic field strength that is not in the metric system, and that's the Gauss. One Tesla is about 10,000 Gauss, so the Earth's field is about half a Gauss. Uh, the largest fields outside of labs are going to be found in MRI machines. They're usually a few Tesla. You can, for 10 or $20, buy a a magnet that will fit in your hand and have a field strength appro approximately one Tesla at its surface. The world record for magnetic fields on the Earth is right at, right at around a thousand Tesla, but m to produce that field they end up destroying the equipment. So the field is only a thousand Tesla for an instant. If we want the magnet to be reusable, the record is more like 50 Tesla.